CD-ROMs were a major technological leap back in the early 90s. All of a sudden, our portable storage capacity jumped from the 3.5 megabyte floppies we were using to over 700 megabytes crammed on this little disk. And it didn't take long for game designers to stop and think, hey, these things are like little laser disks. We could put movies and stuff on them, and we could make kick-ass games out of that. Well, yes, they could put movies on them, but the whole kick-ass games thing just didn't happen for the most part. Sure, there were some early examples in those days of great games with FMV like The Seventh Guest or Myst, but even then the FMV was more a hindrance. Perhaps the pages you work so hard for? Look at this fuckstick. Who let him out? Back then, it was just so awesome to see movies and stuff like that happen on your computer, though, but it didn't take long for the novelty of FMV to wear off, and the gaming community realized that they bought a bunch of games that were huge piles of dog shit, and we rebelled against them like when people declared Disco dead once and for all. And what's my payback? A million pounds of tube steak. What? The first ones I got were games with tacked-on FMVs like Mega Race, a fairly bland car shooter hosted by the painfully unfunny Lance Boyle. A guy so dreadful he didn't even warrant a cheesy laugh track. Thanks to you, criminals everywhere are turning to each other and saying, I want my mommy. Hey, I'm Lance Boyle and it doesn't hurt a bit. Then there was Critical Path, a game that took me about four months to even get working because in those days, QuickTime was a piece of shit. And even then it was one of the worst games I'd ever witnessed. Not only because you died constantly, but because you had to keep sitting through some of the worst FMV acting in history. It's just a game. A sick game. With some maniac pulling the strings. Welcome to my facility. <laughs> I'm General Min. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful gun. <laughs> And really, once you knew all the patterns and codes, the game only turned out to be like 20 minutes long. Almost as soon as the technology became available, they started porting in arcade shooters like Space Pirates, Crime Patrol, and they barely counted as games. Let's kick some butt. The Roused Hour! At some point, you just played it to chuckle at the cornball acting because, let's face it, you were playing a light gun rail shooter with your mouse. This galaxy is mine! Who can stop this mad pirate? We are under huh. attack. Repeat, what does this remind me of? <laughs> Roll fizzle beef. Well, the production values for some of these games were huge, and they started roping in movie stars to appear in them, like the Daedalus Encounter. The Daedalus Encounter starring Tia Carrere in the hottest role of her career is an actor. Yeah, right. There were a lot of others that sort of blurred together in their mediocrity, like Iron Helix, The Journeyman Project, or Microcosm. Sierra made a few games like Gabriel Knight 2 and Phantasmagoria, which were pretty good, but the latter of which also serves as a shining example of why FMV is generally a really, really bad idea. But honestly, the game is this glorious mashup of being hilariously bad, while at the same time being profoundly fucked up that it becomes completely awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you the possessed madman who puts a smile on your face before he puts a scythe blade in it, Crazy Don! A woman's body is a wonderful thing, but the head is useless! That's right, he's possessed with the soul of a psycho demon slash sorcerer, but sometimes you've just gotta laugh! But this game gets dark, man. Like when Don scalps an old lady and wears it as a hat. Let's order some pizza. A little extra sauce, huh? <laughs> but even Don has his limits, and he knows how to keep that pimp hand strong. Oh, you do not get much more own than that. But a lot of people know about Phantasmagoria, but I have a couple favorites not many people remember. Take-Two Interactive put forward one of the most ambitious interactive movie projects I've ever seen called Ripper, 
which is a weird little sci-fi murder mystery spread out over six CDs involving the most star-studded cast I've ever seen on a game, including, get this, Christopher Walken, John Rhys Davies, Paul Giamatti, Tani Welch, David Patrick Kelly, Burgess Meredith, and Jimmy Walker. And it's all set to Blue Oyster Cult's Don't Fear the Reaper. Are you kidding me? This game nearly caused a rift in the Space Awesome Continuum. They basically advertised it as a movie, which was genius. Seriously, just sit back and watch this. It's about catching a killer. You know, to catch the Ripper, you're gonna have to outthink him. The police, Pa! I'm sure they're in on it. Run over it, Rock! Look, Falcon Eddie? Well, I think you got it. The wheels of justice may grind slowly, but they're moving. They're moving. Get yourself caught in those wheels, Quinlan. You'll be in a lot of pain. Get the guy out of my head, his stealth, his tools. I've been collecting knives for 30 years. I don't have a clue what kind of blade he's using. He's out. But it's on your conscience. He strikes again. Mr. Quinlan, if you have a knife with a man's fingerprints on it, Wrong murder weapon. Talk to that reporter, so help me. I will kill you because I know what drives him to it. So don't you dare think you understand that killer. Or me. Oh, that's just brilliant. You could get this in theaters, man. But honestly, don't fear the Reaper. The song actually does have some major significance. The lyrics are key to solving the final puzzle of the game and finding out who Jack the Ripper is. Because the title of the song sort of sounds like Don't Fear the Ripper. Reaper. Ooh, see, that's weak, okay? I see what you did there, but ouch. I even read that Christopher Walken wasn't even happy with the version of the song they ended up using for the game. I'll be honest, fellas, it was sounding great, but I could have used a little more cowbell. It's this weird little era of gaming that's slowly being forgotten, mainly because these games are so hard to get running anymore on modern computers. Computers are actually too sophisticated to run them anymore. Most of these games ran on DOS, which, if you know how to use DOSBox, may not pose much of a problem, but a lot of them were coded to run specifically on Windows 3.1, a titanic piece of shit that ran on top of DOS, and was hard enough to get running at the time. For instance, this is the best I ever managed to pull off the Star Trek Klingon game. Koi kelles pook lod, koi pook bet pook, yakbo mapo jeshu mi, se mapshu me u, mapshu my long, and mapshu ju, ni bay is much a ton, koo, but my cherry bets el jo pi, ma fa pu ma di im karak, ma tu tak tu ma bel ko ma shu tak, ma o. Kapla! Now back in 1998, Take-Two Interactive released another game much like Ripper called The Black Dahlia. It claimed to star Dennis Hopper and Terry Garr, even though they only appeared in the game for like a few minutes. But what really struck me about a lot of these FMV games, especially the Take-Two Interactive ones, was how many discs they came packed with. Ripper came packed with six, and Black Dahlia shipped with eight. Eight discs. And this wasn't even the most of all these games. You knew these games were trouble when you got them, because you knew you'd be switching discs to go anywhere constantly. There were games like Seventh Guest, Eleventh Hour, Dark Side of the Moon, where you would have to switch discs going to different rooms in the same building. Under a Killing Moon was the worst for that. You know, frankly, I'm pretty insulted. Now hey, don't get me wrong. I loved that game. Under a Killing Moon was a great game, but you'd have to switch between four CDs two or three times just going down the street. No! I remember Black Dahlia having some of the best acting of any game I'd seen. And even though it's agonizing slow most of the time, and it doesn't make much sense, it's easily better than the lame-ass Black Dahlia movie with Josh Hartnett. Mostly, I help out with the hobos. It's pretty fun, and even pretty it? horrific at times. Especially when the torso killer starts sending you yeah, packages. Man told me you'd give me a nickel if I gave this to you. Alright. I'm game.
Here you go. Thanks, mister. And hey, what's in here? I don't know. Shut up. The interactive movies were the worst, and when you talk about bad FMV games, you're usually talking about these. Probably the most notorious of these was Fox Hunt, even though nobody really played it. It just looks stupid, and I mean dumber than an episode of VIP. It's about some hapless dope who enjoys striking poses like Ace Ventura, as he gets recruited by the CIA to track down a supervillain. Mostly you just spin around in circles clicking the use button until something happens. Usually something very, very stupid. let this go on any longer. The last game I'd like to highlight is one that I remember very fondly, but nobody else seems to. A game based somewhat on a Keanu Reeves movie, based somewhat on a William Gibson hallucination, Johnny Mnemonic. A game that only ran on Windows 3.1, a game so heinous that installing it somehow torched my master boot record. I didn't even think that was possible with DOSBox, and even when I recovered, it still didn't work. You don't even want to know what I had to do to get this footage. Even back in the day, trying to get games to work under fucking Windows 3.1 was about as fun as getting a tombstone pile driver in a shit-filled toilet. The story is structured almost exactly like the movie. Johnny's a mnemonic courier, a guy who can smuggle data in his head like a hard drive. He has to make room for this information by erasing parts of his own memory and apparently his acting talent. Oh, I got it, Ralphie. And a couple of babysitters, too. What are those bugs doing They're guarding their property, Ralphie. No, you listen. I'm a dead man if I don't get this out of my head. Just, um, calm down. Calm down? No, I don't think anybody could have made this no material compelling, but this is just hammy. Now, you'll notice the game is almost exactly like Fox Hunt. You barely even played these games. All you could do was turn left or right, move forward, or just hit a generic use key. And half the time you didn't even know what you'd end up using. Especially in Johnny Mnemonic, where everything is futuristic and you have no idea what the fuck anything is. Actually, there is another key shown in the instruction book that it calls Download. And you'll only use it a grand total of like three times to download the access code. Well, why can't I just hit the Use key? Speaking of which, never ever try to use the computers in Johnny Mnemonic. Because every time you try, the game assumes you're trying to rip the data out of your head, it microwaves your brain, and you instantly die. Oh, this is ridiculous. Why do they even give you this option? You'll find a computer terminal in almost every location, but it's guaranteed suicide if you try it. It's like some kind of idiot trap where you wander into a new room and say, well, hey, here's a computer. Maybe this one will work. Nope. And you need to get your computer to work because you need the three parts of the download code which was destroyed. Luckily, there's an artificial intelligence in the Internet that's willing to help you. But there's a catch. I have the download code. It's stored in three separate data port locations here in Newark. What do you mean you've hidden the download code? Why would you do that? I mean, I need that code before my head explodes. What, you're telling me you're some kind of artificial intelligence and you can't store and email me three fucking JPEG files? What the fuck good are you? I'm sorry, Johnny. <sighs> anyway, to get the computers to work, you need to collect the three components of the neural interface, and without them, using the computers is an instant death sentence. 
you'd think Johnny would be smart enough not to try plugging his brain into a neural interface without the required equipment, but nope. He's all too happy to flash fry his frontal lobes every time you command it. What an asshole. Wish I could get out of the game this easily. So, the main point of the game is searching for the computer parts. Most of the time you'll just rummage around people's houses and covertly steal their stuff, putting the items into your infinitely deep jacket pocket. And most of the time the game gives you no idea of where you're supposed to be going, what you're supposed to be doing, what items you're supposed to collect, what the items you're collecting actually do, or where you're supposed to use them. You have no control over when Johnny uses them. If he has the particular item at the time he needs to use it, he uses it. If he doesn't have it, most of the time you just die. And when you die, you have no, no idea why you died, or what item you might have needed to prevent dying. Why is there money in the toilet? Anyway, you'll die a lot. What'll happen is the Yakuza hitman with the techno whip coming out of his thumb and his sidekick, some white guy who looks like Andy Dick on steroids, will burst into the room with guns and chase you through the level. Problem is, you never know which way to go, and the game is outright merciless. There aren't any hints. You just have to pick a direction and go. If you're wrong, you get shot. If you're right, you run to the next screen and repeat the process over and over again until you've played it so many times, you've just memorized the proper sequence. It's like playing Dragon's Lair without the flashing hints. Do I take the door? Nope. The hall? The window? Oh. I know, I'll grab the gun on the floor. Oh, come on! What's worse is the action is so choppy and poorly edited that it's hard to tell even what's happening. It's so dark and the action is so spastic, these guys could be coming from anywhere. It's like the editor is having a stroke. And once you finally figure it out, the scene usually concludes with either you or your bodyguard Jane getting into a fist fight, either with a Yakuza guy or his friend who looks like Andy Dick. From here the camera switches to this hilarious point of view shot, where you see your opponent juking and jiving. Wow! It's like I'm in the game! It's like I'm really getting my ass kicked by Super Andy Dick! Just check out this amazing fighting engine. There's no health gauge, no rules, no mercy. A lesser man might be scared of Andy Dick, but I am the Lord of Tekken and I will air juggle his ass! What the? Hey! Ow! Oh, what the fuck? What am I? Is there any strategy to this? Well, apparently, yes, there are tips on how to fight effectively. Let's look at what the instruction book has to say on fight mode. You enter into fight mode as either Johnny or Jane when they and the enemy square off against each other. Uh, brilliant, thanks. Uh, both will enter a fighting stance. No way! To fight, press punch, kick, or block when the screen goes to letterbox format. You can only choose one action per opportunity. Yeah, that's what I was doing wrong, because I keep trying to perform the rare simultaneous flying punch kick that I learned from that Shaolin Monastery. And no kicking while blocking, that's cheating. In general, it is best to punch or kick when the enemy is moving away or their posture creates an opening. Block when you sense the enemy attacking. Uh, during the fight, you will see reaction shots. If the opponent is struggling, you are winning. If Johnny or Jane is stumbling, you are losing. No shit. If you win, Johnny or Jane returns to full strength and the game continues. If you lose, the game is over and you return to the main menu. Okay, how fucking stupid does this game think I am? Winning is good. Losing is bad. Pro tip, don't get beaten up by Andy Dick. It doesn't even matter when you punch or kick. It's just dumb luck on whether or not you connect. And believe me, I tried following those bullshit instructions. It's useless. And you might as well forget about blocking. Just jam on the attack buttons and hope you win. There doesn't even seem to be any difference between punching and kicking. It's not like the game's sophisticated fighting AI will adapt to your master strategy requiring you to mix up your attacks into unpredictable combos. What a bunch of dog shit. You'll also fight one of Ralphie's cyborg bodyguards. In fact, you fight her every time you go to Ralphie's. As if she never gets tired of you kicking her ass. The bitch is persistent, that's for sure. But no wonder I'm having so much trouble beating her. Look at this. She's got hyperkinetic legs. 
Wonder Woman! Really, there's no reason to go to Ralphie's. You're supposed to go to the subway in order to get to Spider's place. And along the way, you encounter a crusty homeless man who just happens to be viewing pornography on some VR glasses. And you need those for your VR rig. But you can only buy them if you give him your toilet money. Hey, wait, why is he reaching into his pants? Help! Yeah. You made it for your dog? So, it's a little... Kinky? Kinky? Maybe working out, but you're uh, whatever. Than my Maybe dog. I can finally use the computer link in the subway. Oh, oh god damn it! You know what? Just give me the fucking good glasses. Give me those glasses! Sorry, buddy, I need it. I'll pay you back triple what it's worth. Violator! Violator! Yeah, violate your mother, you fucking hobo. Triple. I'll get triple. Triple your Spend your triple. fucking spare change on Just VR porn. Oh, and the only place you can go down here is spiders. If you try to go anywhere else, a techno subway kills you. Yeah, mind the gap, I guess. In the future, if you're in a subway station, you'd better stay the fuck behind the blue line. You can stop the trains if you disable the fuse box controlling the electrified rail. But first you have to get the key from the maintenance locker, which apparently is protected by Zordon from the Power Rangers. Any attempt to use this device without proper identification will result in severe bodily harm. Alpha, readers escaped. Recruit a team of teenagers with attitude. Whoa! Do not fuck with Zordon. The transit authority in the future does not fuck around. Okay, then you go to Spiders. Hey, I wonder if I can use this computer. Duh. Duh. It's not true what they say. You don't get NAS from amp jobs. So then what does cause it? The world causes it! This causes it! You cause it! I cause it! All the electronics poisoning the airwaves! John. Does anybody else wish Henry Rollins would just rock out from the shadows and pound this fucker with a folding chair? Why does Jane even like this asshole? They leave you alone to go have sex behind a curtain. Yeah. Which gives you ample time to sneak around his place and steal everything that's not nailed down. But I like to bother Spider all the time just to watch him freak out at being cock-blocked every two minutes. Go away. She needs a rest. You mind? Yeah. Are you ready to go? I'll meet you at the top of the stairs. Until then, scrog! After that, you finally complete the computer rig, and then you wander around three endless virtual reality mazes until you find the download code. And when you're done, the street preacher attacks. Never call me that. My Japanese friends told me not to touch your head. But they didn't say anything about the rest of your miserable pagan carcass. <laughs> He's a street preacher. He looks like the guy who rents me videos at Blockbuster. Anyway, he's supposed to be this big bad mama jama, but he doesn't even carry a gun. It's the future! You know what happens to dudes who carry punching daggers in the future? Yeah. I never liked mercenaries. But you hired him! Anyway, let's see. Try to run, get blown up, run a different way, get blown up, keep running. Eventually you run into the guy who can pull the data out of your head, this guy named J-Bone, who runs a group of rebels against the corporate man called Lotex. But guess who it really is? It's Isaac Hayes! I must be carrying the hidden secrets of Scientology and Lord Xenu in my head. Or maybe the recipe to chocolate salty balls. It's really sad when the biggest celebrity in your movie is Isaac Hayes. Okay, so they hook you into the computer to pull the data out. Man, doesn't it seem like we're forgetting something? Oh, pfft, right. Yeah, good job guarding the front door, you low-tech astards. Chef, no! Okay, well, Jane totally owns the Yakuza guy, and Chef tells you to use the mainframe computer as a last resort to uplink the data to the satellite. Hey, okay, no problem. Oh, come on! It's getting to be a goddamn ridiculous around here. Well, before you can use the computer, you have to fiddle with all the controls, setting the power, but not too high or you explode, aligning the dish, choosing the only IO protocol that isn't broken, then you fight a techno samurai. Wait, what? We'll meet again. 
and, and then you can finally upload the data. Ugh. Well, at least that's over and the world is safe. Then it's over. <laughs> oh, what is this shit? The game's over, dude. Let it go. You are outnumbered and outclassed, brother. No one defeats me. We but are you fell from a bridge and you're not even wet. This is bullshit. Oh no, don't shoot him or anything, guys. I got this. Notice they didn't bother bringing Street Preacher back, like in the movie for this fight, because the Preacher in this game is just lame. It takes you a few tries, but eventually you beat up the guy, they throw him in a chair, and they tell you to upload just something into his brain, requiring me to use the computer again. You want the data? You got your data. Jerry! You heard him, man. Download everything! Pestilence has ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and horror of blood. Someone's receiving. This is Ursula Sky, commander of Colonial Star One. We are under attack. Repeat, under attack. My ship has been overrun by the Black Brigade. Captain Talon is in control of the Star Splitter Cannon. They're beaming colonists aboard the Black Dragon as hostages until the cannon crystals are found. Situation bleak. Deflector shield destroyed. Can't hold out much longer. Please respond. homeland. The evil machinery that works his sinister mind has concocted a diabolical plan to exterminate us all. <laughs> Welcome aboard the Black Dragon. Pay no attention to this lovely but pitiful creature. Any attempt to come to her aid will be met with certain extermination. You see this black hole? It was Parallax did this to me. Now I will answer him with his own star splitter. This galaxy is mine! Who can stop this mad pirate? As it stands now, it looks as though this malevolent mystery and his armada of cutthroat pirates will succeed. And his quest is my greatest Greatest creation, the Star Splitter Cannon. Talon needs now are the star crystals that will arm it. Well, these 
crystals have been lost for years on different worlds throughout the solar system. We must find them before Talon does. The journey will be treacherous and fraught with danger. There are many foes. Not only will you have to repel the Black Brigade, a formidable and seemingly invincible force, there will also be mutant life forms, sorcerers and mystics with their own bag of tricks. They will do all in their power to keep you from the Star Crystals. Then, of course, there is the greatest nemesis of them all, Captain Talon. But I want you to know, I believe we can do it. You and me. I've got a star splitter here that will blast that robotic space pirate crew out of the stars forever. What I need is a quick hand and a keen eye. What I need.